All right, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is the License Portability Committee, Committee meeting for the Board of Behavioral Science. Today is June 8th. It is 1.03 p.m. and we're at the Department of Consumer Affairs hearing room in Sacramento. Um, let's go ahead and start by calling to order and establishing a quorum. Good afternoon. Dr. Leah Brew. Here. Christina Wong. Here. Renee Lawner. We have a quorum. Great. And let's do introductions. Why don't we start over here? I legal counsel. Kim Manson, executive officer for the board. Leah Brew, LPCC member. Christina Wong, LCSW member. Renee Lawner, LCSW member. Christy Berger, regulatory analyst for the board. Roseanne Helms, legislative analyst for the board. Would my audience like to introduce themselves as well? It's not required. You don't have to. Well, might as well. <laughs> Thank you. This is, uh, I'm Mike Griffin. Nice to be here. I'm from California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. G. V. Ayers with California Association for Licensed Professional Clinical Counselors. Arlene Davis, Hope Counseling Center. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. All right. So let's move on to item number two with discussion and possible recommendation for out-of-state uh, license requirements for LPCCs. Okay, so at our last uh, committee meeting, the committee discussed proposed framework language for LPCC out-of-state applicants. Um, and attachment A shows the proposed language that was discussed. Um, amendments to the current law that, that were discussed at that meeting are shown in blue. Um, and then there were a few areas um, that the committee wished to update or, or make some changes to. So those are shown in red. Uh, there are also some other uh, areas that staff determined additional amendments were needed. So those are also shown in red in your attachment. Um, so under the proposal, the board can issue a license to a person who holds a license in another jurisdiction of the U.S. as a professional clinical mental health counselor at the highest level for independent practice if they have been current and active and unrestricted for two years immediately prior to the date that they apply. They have to have a qualifying degree that's a master's or doctoral degree that was a, from an accredited or approved school. They have to submit fingerprints. The, they have to pass the board's California law and ethics exam, complete a 12 hour California law and ethics course and a 15 hours of coursework in California cultures. And notice in here that there's no mention of the clinical exam. Um, after some discussion with legal and uh, looking at the language, we assume that that's already handled through their other states. We're not going to even look for a clinical exam score uh, in, the, in the application process for this, if they qualify under this section. Also, the committee decided that once a, somebody is issued a California license under, this, uh, these qualification, under these requirements, the licensee must, in their first renewal period, complete a one-time six-hour course in mental health recovery-oriented care. There's also a provision built in that LPCCs who are licensed in another state that pre permits treatment of couples and families, to, that they can do so upon licensure in California as long as they complete their required six hours of CE in couples and family, married to family couples and family work every renewal cycle. Uh, if the state did not permit LPCC treatment of couples or family, then we don't know of any that do not permit it, then they would have to, re to meet the regular um, couples and family process under section 4999.20. And also in this proposal um, for consistency, for applicants who do not, do not qualify to apply as an out-of-state licensee, we're reducing the California law and ethics coursework requirement from 18 hours to 12 hours. The committee had decided that was sufficient for out-of-state licensees who qualify, so we're just making that uniform across the board. We've also put in place some additional amendments. Um, looking at the language, the 12-hour California law and ethics coursework um, there, the LPCC section was missing two particular topics that MFT and LCS law already, LCSW law already contain. Um, there was a, a 
statement that it needed to include differences in legal and ethical standards in different types of work settings. So that's been added to LPCC out of state requirements and licensing law and licensing process. So that's been added for consistency. And we've also specified acceptable, prov acceptable providers of this coursework where it's needed. Um, we made an addition to section 4999.61 so what we had to do, this, there used to be a section that applied to out-of-state licensees versus non-licensed people coming in from out-of-state. Um, because we are now letting in people with under special requirements that have been licensed two years or more, we had to make another section that was sort of everybody else. So that could include people with a license that's less, less than two years. It could include somebody that's unlicensed, or it could include somebody that's been licensed for a long time, but for some reason doesn't meet the requirements of the new section. Um, so we had to build certain things into 499.61 that used to just apply to non-licensed people um, to account for some of these um, short-term license, they, somebody who may have held a license for just two years or less. Um, we had to build in the provision to allow an out-of-state licensee to count time actively licensed in, their, in good standing in their other state um, at a rate of 100 hours per month up to 1,200 hours maximum because that was previously permitted even for somebody licensed less than two years. Um, we also added in the provision stating that if somebody has a license or registration that is active and in good standing, that if they've already taken the clinical exam score, uh, or if they've already passed the clinical exam, that their score, their passing score is acceptable as long as it's the exam that we accept. Um, and so those, those were kind of two more recent changes that we made in the past couple of months. Um, one interesting question for discussion, um, a section that we're deleting that applied to, um, to out-of-state non-license holders was 499.63, um, or actually that was, for, that was previous or for people that had a license. It allows licensees to remediate up to six core content areas except California law and ethics and assessment and diagnosis while registered as an associate. So one question for discussion is, um, does the committee wish, wish to include this provision in 499.62 um, for those who have a license? In other words, do you want to allow remediation for short licensees who've only been licensed for a short time? Do you want to allow them to remediate um, their core content areas while um, they are registered, or do they need to wait until they've become registered? Or, wait to, to get the registration. Um, a couple of other I items for discussion um, that we just wanted to bring up. Kim had, had gone to um, a, a meeting and it had been discussed that does it matter to the board if the individual in the other state had grandparented into the, into the licensure in that other state? So that might be an item for discussion. Um, another question is that the board currently serves as a primary source verification um, and we do that through seal, getting sealed transcripts um, which we probably still would do um, and also if there's um, experience we verify experience with supervisor signatures um, so is there any concern that this new process which wouldn't have supervisor signatures it probably would have transcripts would affect our primary source verification um, and finally, one more thing I wanted to point out. There's a deletion on page nine that I want to make um, where it's talking at the very bottom of page nine, um, subsection um, big D and then little three III, um, where it says this coursework may be taken from an accredited or approved school, college, or university, or a CE provider. Um, 499.33 already specifies where the coursework needs to come from, and it's not for a CDE provider. So um, I think that we should not make that amendment there. So those are, that gives us a, a few things to discuss. So we can start by getting everybody's thoughts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have questions too, but let's start with the four things that you pose. Um, so the first one was uh, what's on the materials about should they be allowed to remediate? Um, and I'm thinking, yes, they should be allowed to remediate. Uh, 
sorry, coming in from another state, if somebody's been licensed for like a year, um, they're allowed to remediate their course, core content area as well, registered as an intern. So I, I, my thought is that we would continue that for people who are licensed only. And we could add a sentence. I was kind of playing around with it a little bit. We can add a sentence that says something like, um, they can can remediate the core content areas if they're licensed in good standing in another state as a mental health professional at the highest clinical level. Yeah, any, any thoughts to counter to that? My thought was the same. I mean, continue what we've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was an easy one. Okay, and then the second one, I didn't write down as you were saying because I wasn't prepared for it. So, how oh, the primary source verification? Primary source verification. Yeah. No, no, no. I thought there was one before um, the primary the, source. Yeah. Somebody Grand, that's grandparent. Grandparent. Yes. So say that one again. So go ahead. Go ahead. Or, I, or, well, anyway, so this came up when I was at ASWB, um, many, 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 many moons ago in all our states. Once upon a time. Um, a clinical exam was not offered. They, there was a grandparenting period, and um, so those folks have licensure. Okay. So the question became, how would cat? Because, and we'll get into this when we. Well, we might as well do it now. Um, I'll touch upon that ASWB presentation because I presented our framework um, to the um, ASWB group, and and it was very well received, but. The question that came out of that was the grandparenting licensees. Um, would you make them retake the clinical exam? My response at that point in time, if they're licensed probably at least 20 years, what value do you gain by having them retest? And I wish I would have thought about this response at the time, but did you make your existing licensees who are grandparented take that clinical exam? And my guess is no. So. If you, yeah, so it's that, that it's, it's what grandparenting <laughs> is. I mean, and in 1945, they registered social workers. Nobody had to actually get licensed and test until the 60s. So, so my, my thought is mm -hmm. there's going to be very few people yes. at that age yes. who are moving in the first place. Right. Um, you know, especially if they've been around if we're talking about people who've been licensed since the 60s that was 40 years ago uh -huh. or more which means they'd be well but this is like 2018 it's almost 2020 right so it's a long time ago right um I, if they aren't harmful in the last 50 years then i think they're probably okay <laughs> yeah i have a hard time making the argument you need to take a test that's to um designed primarily to demonstrate that you possess the minimum competency to enter the practice, but you've been practicing for 35 years and you've got no disciplinary. Exactly. To me, that just seems like a very arbitrary barrier. Yes. And then, you know, they still require them to have, you know, a good standing. You know, it yeah. has to be free and clear. So mm -hmm. if they haven't subject to any discipline, and, you know, and like you say, you know, the licensing exam pretty much is just measure the minimum. If they have many years, take or not taking a licensing exam is only you know, only one of the measurement, you know, about right. their you know, competency. So I'm okay with just, I mean, they have a license. Exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so yeah. that, I think that's, yeah. There have to be Microphone. My licensing exam was in 76. So we're only talking about the years there was a license, mid 60s, right. to perhaps, or I didn't take the first exam that was given, perhaps early 70s, yeah, you're talking about a, a group either zero or single digits very small, over a exactly. very, very, very small. tiny group. And they would be moving. Right. They like, will be yeah, very the old. percentage of people who are actually practicing still at all, and then they're going to be moving to California and want to continue to practice. Right. Yeah, no. So I think the risk no. is so small that that we'll be fine. So we're all, any, any, we're all on the same page. We're okay with yeah. grandparenting. Anybody there? No? Okay. Okay. And then the next. Um, great grandparenting. <laughs> <laughs> it is great grandparenting because they were already grandparented in. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. GV heirs with CalPIC, uh, yes, we would agree with the grandparent provision. Those who practice safely uh, without getting in, in trouble uh, for that period of time should. 
uh, should be qualified. Of course, I say that as a grandparent as well. Yeah. So. Great grandparent. Different Me too talk. now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Love you. It. Roseanne, you. Yes, so the next topic um, is the primary source verification, if there would be any effect with this proposal on that. Yeah, I, I think you're going to get verification that they're licensed and you're gonna get verification of their degree that it was from an accredited institution, mm -hmm. I think that's adequate. Right, and that will qualify. The primary source verification is that we verify their education and experience. We would verify the education from the transcripts. One question along that line is um, for ASWs and social workers, ASWB is setting up a social registry where you can deposit all your documents, your, you know, for those states that really want to continue to look at all of them. So the question becomes, are we comfortable, are we willing to accept a degree, a, a, a certified copy of the transcripts from ASWB rather than the institution? And it, I, I've been wrestling with this, and then I thought, well, what if the school doesn't exist anymore? And ASWB is the only place that has it. I mean, if, if they had to take it for license, what somebody in a state had to take it for licensure, are we comfortable with a certified copy? So will, um, so right now, I think we're talking about LPCC. Yeah, you so are, but it's the same to, thing. Yeah, I know it's the same thing. So if that's why I'm thinking it's on the same line. You know, do, do, do we have kind of like a, you know, data bank, you know, that you talk about that, that we, for, for the other um, organization? Um, I think, um, I don't know. I, no, I don't no, think so, no, yeah, um, MBCC has talked about it, yeah. ASWB is actually building it, and MFTs no. So my thought would be either or. We would either be, you know, if, you know, yes, the transcript would be the preferred, but it, in, in absence of that, a certified copy from ASWB or whatever national professional association that has a single repository, if they want to certify it, I would be comfortable with that. I think I would want to, um, I am comfortable with it, but I would want to name the three major organizations mm -hmm. um, because national organizations pop up all the time right. everywhere, and those three really have, um, I don't know, demonstrated that they're strongly run, well-funded, uh, I don't know, they, they feel safe, so I would name those three organizations as being the only ones. <clears throat> if NBCC ends up being the counseling one or ACA, whoever um, that's tied in with that loop, because they, they're a little bit different than AS, AS. Yeah, yeah, so, and I can confirm with NBCC what they wanna do, if they're gonna do it that way. Um, ASWB will be relieved. And I don't think that the AMFT group is doing it. Not yet. So, wait, not yet, but they may. Yeah. They may, but if we tie it to, and here's how you could tie it. They're also the, the entities that administer the national exam. Ah. Uh, so. Yeah. yeah, so if you tie it to that. I also, I almost feel like that, that naming the organization should be something that's done in regulations, um, like that's as they come on board. Yeah. Um, not necessarily in law because we don't really go into that level of detail in law right now about where the transcripts have to come from and they have to be sealed that's more of a regulation thing in my opinion i'm okay with that um, is that what you think so okay so put that in regulations okay. that it's the testing uh organizations national organizations yeah because that'll never Acceptable. change yeah that'll never change now are they to give their transcripts and if they can't, we default to that? Or can they just say, hey, just go to the database? A or B. Okay, A or B. A yeah. or B. Good. I would say either is acceptable. Yeah. Because, I, you know, to get the money out of ASWB registry, I'm sure they're going to charge a fee. I'm sure. As will the school. So, I, you know, it's not a matter of somebody saving. It's going to be a matter of what's cheaper, probably. Right. Okay. Um, so just kind of jogged my memory when somebody said data bank. There was something I was looking at for another committee meeting, looking at some um, of the other board's laws, and I believe it's pharmacy board um, requires applicants coming from another state to do their own query on the national practitioner data bank and submit it to the board. And I think that might be an idea to explore here because 
you could have somebody who's licensed in a couple states, but they only give us certification for one, and maybe there's a problem in the, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know, you know, not every state reports to that from what I understand, but that might be something to. And that's for the disciplinary action. Disciplinary, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. It, yeah. I like it, I, but the challenge is not everybody reports. So, and what you miss out on, it's not going to be the convictions, because we'll get that through the FBI check. You'll miss out on disciplinary conviction or action taken by the board. But I like the query thing. It's beyond them to do it, yeah. I think it would be really curious to see if you do the query, does it, how does that work? Does it reflect that you're licensed in that state, but there's no reported action? I haven't seen you've... one, but we can see what, you know, it looks like from, we could see if the pharmacy board can, you know, show us something, you know, an example. It's, here's what I'm thinking. If it does, then that's sort of a double check against mm -hmm. um, them self-reporting all the states that they're licensed in. And if there's no reported action, then we at least know that they're licensed in that state and then we can verify it um, because maybe that state doesn't report. That's what I'm thinking. Would, would, it's not something we would want to do though rather than have it be self, you know, if, it, if it's unfavorable maybe from one state, how do we make sure that that's just not missing unless we do it? I'm saying, well, if we do it, we won't know where they're licensed. So I don't know. I'd look, we, I want to ask, because if it's us simply submitting a query and it brings back the licensing information but no reported action, uh, you, then okay, good. And if we want to take that extra step, then we can verify that because maybe that state's not reporting. Because there is a published list, list from the data bank about who's um, compliant with the reporting laws and who's not. We are. Um, so that, that, that's another, I, I, I kind of like that idea, but I want to see what it looks like. I mean, if all we get is nothing, it's goose eggs, and it's kind of useless. So is that something that needs to go in regulation? No. Do you guys just want to ex Let me explore that, because that, that's a quick phone call. Okay. That's, that's not a hard, it, it's not a hard thing to find out. But if, if it does, if it does pop back, and it does give what I think it might give us, then that might be something that we make just part of the application process, and I think that's reg, so. Put it on the application. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other comments about that as we move on? So then the, the uh, fourth thing that Roseanne mentioned on page 9, D, triple I, um, remove that amendment because it's uh, already. Yeah, it's, our, it's duplicative and it's a, it takes it a bit farther than it needs to go with the, okay. the um, a, a core content area can't be remediated, remediated by um, continuing education. So, um, yeah, I'd like to delete that. Yeah. I trust you on that one. <laughs> Any comments on that? Okay. All right, so I had a question. Um, when we go up to page two on the bullet points, um, the additions to 40, 4999.61, the first bullet point, allowing out-of-state licensee to count time actively in good standing toward the 3,000 hours. Um, so there were two pieces that I had questions about that. Um, so if they, if their state only requires 2,000 hours and they've been licensed for a year and a half and they have the 3,000 hours, then they've met the time requirement, the post. But then if he or she meets the practicum requirement and then they have to go back and remediate the practicum requirement even though they've been practicing with a license for a year? Right, so we have it for people that are um, unlicensed or licensed less than two years now, or I think it's four years now. Um, we requ we allow it's an either or. You can either when we did the out of state committee, we did, the committee had decided you can either remediate the practicum because there was the issue of some states not requiring the same amount of practicum that we do, or you could remediate some of the three thousand hours. I think the the concern now is we didn't, they didn't want somebody remediating their practicum 
Um, and it's only been licensed for a short amount of time and remediating hours as well. Um, so that's why that was made an either or when we ran that bill. Not how I'm reading it. Allowing an out of state license to count time actively licensed toward the 3,000 at a rate of 100 per month up to 1,200 maximum if he or she meets the practic practicum requirements. So if they, if they meet the practicum requirements, then they're allowed to remediate. Uh, if, they're, if they don't meet the practicum requirements and they have to remediate that because they're, they don't have it, then they have to do that or it's, you don't pass go, you don't move forward. So the practicum would be the number one thing you would have to remediate. If you don't have to remediate it, then you can count the hours. So they, they could conceiv conceivably have 2,000 hours of their post-degree hours mm -hmm. and been practicing for a year, so mm -hmm. technically have their 3,000 hours because now we're counting that extra year. Um, and if they didn't meet the practicum requirements, they can't count the last year of working as a licensee. Right. Not towards the practicum. You're right. That, feel, that feels wrong for that you. That feels really wrong for me. They're, I mean, if they just waited six months, let's say they'd been licensed 18 months before applying, <laughs> right, and they've got an active license in another state, then, then they can apply for the, there's something weird about that to me, to remediate practicum in particular. Like if they're not licensed, I have no issue with those rules. But if they're already practicing independently, yeah, it was kind of a part of a big discussion about whether we should at the time, you know, we weren't allowing any remediation of practicum. So, right. And it was more mainly for some of the older degrees that were coming through, like the 36 unit and such. So that's not going to apply here because this no, because is going to be already licensed. they're already licensed. So we're thinking about somebody who's newly licensed. That doesn't meet the practice. I mean, it could be that we just go back and don't allow remediation of the practicum requirement again and allow remediation of the hours. Um, and if somebody doesn't meet the practicum, then they can demonstrate by becoming a license in their state, by licensee in their state, that. Um... I'm very confused. Okay. In the sense that, you know, so are we talking about the associates? No, these are no, licensees. I, I don't have issues with associates. I'm, I'm talking about somebody who's already licensed. These are co people coming in. But, but they mark. haven't hit the two year mark yet. Then we're going to make them remediate practicum. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Okay. Now I'm not confused anymore. Thank you. Yeah, but what do you think? <laughs> yes. Microphone, microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so there are some states that require less than our amount of practicum. Is that okay? Yes, especially right. for some of the older degrees. Forget about older degrees. But that, it's not yeah, it doesn't be relevant. Count, but yeah, there are some states that don't. <laughs> um, gosh, I wish They'd my have 200 group. instead of 280. So they got to go remediate 80 hours even right. though they've been licensed for a year. It see doesn't how feel that feels, right. right? I mean, it, I don't see how that adds public protection. <laughs> I so, mean, the goal is public protection. Okay. <sighs> Trying to reduce barriers here. These are not people who. It, these so are people obviously who are they licensed. have the license, so we would not. You're okay. I'm a year and a half in. I didn't really have practicum. You had practicum. I just had not practicum. as many hours. Everybody just not as many practicum. hours. Mm -hmm. You may even have had 3,000 hours post degree. But I'm going to have you make up 80 hours of practicum. Uh huh. Uh, it, it just seems wrong. Right. So let's do two yeah. different rules <laughs> one for people who've been licensed less than two years. And then keep what you have here for the people who are not yet licensed. Right. So the people who are not, so if you look at on page 8, 4999.62, um, that's what that requirement is. Um, very last sentence of page 8. Um, so the, it's listing the requirements, and it says six semester units or nine quarter units of practicum and the 280 hours. So that would be, um, and then we would have something that basically say an out of state applicant who holds a valid license in good standing in another state is exempt from this requirement. Yes. If are exempt from the practicum requirement. To, right. to make up their practicum. practicum. Yeah, but. Okay, so then the next question is if 
they're already licensed and their state only requires 2,000 hours because many states, I think there's only one at 1,000, but all the rest are above 2,000. Right. Um, so their state meets 2,000 require the 2,000 hours and they're, they've been licensed a year, so they get, let's say, the 1,200 hours, so then they don't have to make up any hours. No, because right. they, you have the 1,000, right. you have the 2,000 plus the 1,200. So it's just, I think, just the, I haven't looked at the laws lately, but I think it was Kentucky or one state that had 1,000 yeah. hours. And, and so, some, yeah, and some states, you know, the high, it depends on how they count it, because some of the states, it's, it's strictly clinical. Right. And other states combine it. Like, we combine it. So that's the problem, too. So let's say that, let's, I'm going to use Kentucky as an example. It sticks out in my mind, and I could totally be wrong. Sorry, Kentucky. Um, if I'm wrong, let's say Kentucky requires a thousand hours, but that's client contact. Right. And so they don't have the 3000, but half of our hours are not client contact. Right. And they would obviously be doing those other things like supervision and, um, oh, case notes going. are still meeting those hours, but they're, they're just not recording them. And so do we penalize them because they didn't record them? So now they got to make up 2,000 hours, even though they're already licensed. Yeah. So if you're le licensed less than two years, you, we would ask them to show a completion of 1,750 clinical hours. Or 3,000 total, or just the 1,750 of clinical? Clinical. So I would feel better saying they have to show 1750 of clinical, clinical, and then if they have to make up the clinical, they have to make up the clinical, rather than looking at the full 3,000. That's a real drastic shift, but I like it. I'm, I really, because that's really what we're interested in. Right. Supervised clinical, clinical. hours. Yes. Yeah. They're going to do case notes. They're going to go to conferences. Yeah. I'm looking at you, GV. What's Dean say? <laughs> Well, we're going to make the same rules for the MFTs, too. So. Yeah, I, I think because, again, it's, it's this whole concept that we really have two application types. You have someone who's never been licensed and someone who has obtained a license. Yes. And it's how you treat them. Um, you've never been licensed, then, you know, you've got to climb the mountain like everybody else did. Right. If you've been licensed, what consideration can we give you? Now, right now we're, we're promoting two years. We're not looking at much. And I think what we're talking about now is, hey, you've been licensed less than two years. So I think lowering it, and it's really not lowering it. It's just looking at the things that are really important. It's, I don't see that as being a, an arbitrary barrier. Right. If we've come to, yeah, come on up. If we've come to the conclusion that 1750 is what's necessary to demonstrate competence, then that's really, even with the other hours, the other hours are to support those. But Right. And, and, and this takes care of it where, you know, the, the states don't count that non-clinical. Right. And so if you got licensed, let's say, Kentucky, and, you know, you did your hours there you could come here you've been licensed for a year so you you get what you submitted to kentucky right and then you're going to get the 1200 from us you've met the requirement you can come in and be licensed right yeah i, I like it yeah and like new york requires 5000 hours but i don't know what's included in those 5000 hours do you <laughs> no i could probably break it down in about 10 minutes but yeah no i think but yeah i think it's giving some consideration to somebody who's already climbed that mountain and obtain licensure, so, you know, what, what can you do to, to recognize that? like it. Darlene Davis, Hope Counseling Center. Um, I like the idea about uh, breaking down the barriers for people coming in out of state, but I just want to throw out, what if someone is from a state that's only 1,000 hours, or even 2,000 hours, but let's, we're talking about 1,000, and they've been licensed one month? And they didn't do the practicum at the same level as us, and they only have a thousand hours, and we're letting them in. If I'm someone looking to go to school, and I live in California, 
I'm jumping over there, yeah. and I'm going to go to school over there, and I'm only going to do 1,000 hours, and I'm going to only get, do six months of practicum, and then I'm going to come to California and get licensed. I don't know how California uh, licensees are going to feel about yeah. that. So let's say that happens. So they won't have any time to add to it. So they'll still have to make up 750 hours. As an associate. As an associate of clinical hours. Of clinical hours. Yeah, of clinical yeah. hours. There's only 1,000, but even 2,000, even 2,000. We have to record right. on clinical hours for 3,000. Right. Why not let us just do clinical hours and not count? non-clinical hours. So I don't know, it has to at least, in my, you know, when I'm advocating for people going to school here, I'm thinking, well, are we letting people come in that are, have less than us, or at least equal of us? A year and a half license, sure, and that's why you guys made the two year, mm -hmm. but one month license? I'm gonna yeah, give it to them, I, yeah if we talked about the one month license, it, let's just assume we all, this is what we did, one month license, you only had a thousand hours in your other state. Sorry, you're going to have to redo them. You're going to have to. Two thousand. Yeah. Two thousand. Two thousand. One month. Then they they would come in. If then it's if all they've clinical. done two thousand clinical hours, it's more than we do. Then they've exceeded well, but our standard. we have standard. to do three thousand total still. So right. But, but the other thousand hours they're wait, doing. We had to wait to get the three thousand. There's people could get seventeen fifty, and try to get their license in California. That, that's I, all I'm saying is it's yeah. a little less, it's less than us. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, well, a couple of points. One is I'm thinking if they've done 2,000 clinical hours, they've done 3,000 total hours. There's no way they could have gotten their supervision and um, not done case notes or gone to meetings. I mean, the profession is nationally is solid enough in all three professions. They um, just but didn't have to prove it. I think to, to your point, Maybe what we do is say um, a minimum that their practicum, not practicum, that their post degree hours had to be a minimum of two years. Yeah, I think. A minimum of two years and 1750 clinical. So if they didn't have the th more, um, if they only had 1,000 clinical hours, then they'd still have to practice a whole nother year and get a minimum of 750. So they'd be under supervision for a solid year with us. And 2,000 hours, you could do that in one year full time. Uh -huh. Yes, exactly. You'd ask them to, that it has to be at least two years. Well, your, your supervised post-degree experience had to, to be at least two years, which I believe all states require that. Okay. Um, when we did the comparison, everybody, if I recall correctly, and I think, Christy, maybe you put the chart together, but I th it's 104 weeks, which is two years. Okay. For for all the states, across the board. Okay. Um, so the, it was in one of the charts, and and I can send you the information, Darlene, if you'd like. But yeah, it's, that's why I'm pretty comfortable because it's similar. All the states, by and large, require the master's degree or doctoral degree from a from an accredited institution, institution regionally and and or an accredited. Um, program depending on where you went to school. Social workers, it's an accredited school of social work. MFT, it's you know an accredited university with um, instruction in mar marriage and family um, therapy. Thank you. Um, they all require practicum. They all require um, two years post degree. So uh, across the 50 states, everybody has that in common. Two years post, post mm -hmm. degree. Yeah. Everybody has that in common. Now, not in the past. Not in now. the past. Not, no, no, but right now. And they're all looking at 60 unit degrees. So California, our 104 weeks before you can apply for your license, I thought that started when they started practicum for LMFTs. 104 weeks? That's a supervised, no. no. It starts after you get after your degree. After years. It starts after, after the you degree. get degree, your degree. Mm -hmm. You can count your practicum hours above the, the minimum, for, not for the LPC, but for the MFT, you can count <clears throat> any hours you did above the minimum from your degree towards your 3,000. So some students can get up to 1,250 hours yeah. yes, tw in there before their degree. And we're actually the most lenient state with that because all the other states are now post-degree. They don't count any pre-degree hours. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, but when you look at the, the similarities across the board, the education is the same, the supervised training is re and time period is the same, and everybody requires passing a clinical exam. So that's sort of the commonalities, and then from there, just sort of whatever, you know. Yeah. I think New York or Florida, for social workers, it's, it's Florida, 4,500 hours. I have no idea why. New York, it's 5,000 hours for L uh, LMHC. Yeah. Whatever yeah. they're called, yeah. The LP, the their highest, LPCs. Yeah. Their highest level for counselors, 5,000 hours. Yeah. Post degree. Yeah. So, oh. you had a so, puzzled look. <laughs> I'm just I'm just thinking on how we would knowing that that most states the standard is now three thousand hours. I think for MFT we have two states that are less. I think they're two thousand. And knowing that it's just a couple of states where the LPC. they have to have the hundred you know the hundred hours a month comes into play. To I think that that covers most people. I think it's going to be kind of a tough sell at the legislature that we're lowering something down that's we're, and we're not lowering it for our in-state people i think that's going to be kind of a, a tough sell right. there um i i don't think it's a large group of people that are going to be disenfranchised for this maybe a couple a handful of them and they can either register as an intern and make up the hour or register as an associate make up the hours or they can wait until they've been licensed i mean if they're going to be really close they can either wait um, or, or they even, can just even if they're not close I'm just sitting here thinking wow if it was me and I understood how this worked I would just sit here and wait a year and keep my license active and then apply yeah and that's kind of worse because now people are not practicing for that year true <laughs> yeah but Rosa makes a really good point about the legislature and how they would view that as us lowering the standard for people coming in and um, nationally, I can tell you that the, the three major associations are promoting um, bare minimum two years up to three years are some of the proposals. So us using two years is probably reasonable. I just, I also feel like in terms of our current people that are here trying to kind of just saying, well, you can just count clinical. The non-clinical isn't really that important. No, exactly. you know, it's kind of it, sending it, that message. Yeah, it doesn't uh, it sit well with me. I anticipate having to explain that and having a difficult time when we're right. ringing the bell. It, it, yeah, and you know, the thing is, is if we don't do this, if we go, so if we abandon all of this, you know, the, the lowering and whatnot, um, we can internally, get, as because those would come to me, <laughs> I can keep a checklist. I mean, if the volume becomes large, then we could come back and revisit yeah. and see if it's really necessary. Do you feel like the legislature would be comfortable with dropping the practicum issue, though, if they're already licensed? I think we could do that. I, that, I think yeah. we could. Be, so. I mean, we're we, keeping it for the non-licensed, and I think keeping that's it the most for the non-licensed people. But I, I think we can do that. Um, I, I'm sure that yeah. that Dean would be will be very happy about that because <laughs> she was a big advocate for the first change. Um, so yeah, I think that's fine. But I think that the hours. It's a little I'm, bit different itself. I'm, I'm with Roseanne because I think it's important that, you know, we're not lowering the standard for the out-of-state people because I, we also have to take care of, you know, what we have, the existing licensees. So why do you hold them for 3,000 and then the other, you know, the other out-of-state people that, oh, yeah, we can take you as far as with the cl clinical hours. It kind of... You know, we need, I, I think the non-clinical hours are there for a reason. Yeah. And so, you know, so I think it's important that we, for that, we cons we're, it is consistent across board, in-state, out-state, the same. So, so that we're not also compromising our consumer protection. You know, why do you have one, you know, a various standard? But I like that, dropping the, the practical part of it. You know, I think that's, that makes sense. D.V. Ayers on behalf of uh, CalPIC. Uh, uh, no, I think you're on the right track. That, that would be good for us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so it sounds like the consensus is we'll drop, if they're licensed, we'll drop the practicum piece, but they will need to meet the other, um, clini the, not clinical, but all the other hours I, I, that are post-degree. Yeah, and we can, I think that's going to fly. Okay. Okay. Then I had another question. Um, so this is just really weird, and you can ignore me if it's 
has its logic. So on page six, under 499.60, which is just above it, um, my brain got confused because I think number four and five should be switched. Like, because we're telling them you have to take the law and ethics exam and you have to take the coursework. I don't know, that just was something weird for me. It seemed like you should take the coursework and then you should take the exam, should be listed in that order. I and, think it, that, it, yeah. and it would be for all three. All three of them have this in this order. Um, I don't know, maybe other people wouldn't be confused by it, but reading, take the exam and then go take the course. I think that makes total sense. It was just kind of the, the the way it fell way into we the discussed brain. it before. I yeah. also, the, 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 on that line, I don't know that we actually need the fingerprint requirements because they're already established by section 144. Um, so I can look into that as well. Um, but if you can, if you need to remove that because it's redundant, then I think we'd, we'd all be fine with that, right? Because if it's only if it's redundant, of course. Right. But I'm also thinking that, you know, the, isn't the, uh, so, you know, so the, the required coursework, you can actually, okay, so it, it can it can it happen actually after taking the the law and ethics exam because a lot of these coursework you know you can i i don't know i'm just thinking about you know right now the um there is a possibility that you know you you know the requirements that you can take you need to take the you know take the licensing exam your first renewal you don't have to pass it and yet you know you're not required to take everything first before you take the licensing exam Right, so somebody- The law and ethics exam. Yeah, somebody, I mean, this is a person that's not going to register, so somebody can come in and say, I wanna take the law and ethics exam, and they can take it any time if they're a licensee. But the, if they wanna take the, maybe they take it once, I mean, they're still gonna to have to take the coursework, whether they do that before and after, or after. I would think they would do it before, but maybe for some reason they do it after, or maybe they try it once and then go and take the coursework, because they realize that- They take it? Maybe they want a head start in taking the exam, I'm not sure, but I, it's not going to matter um, for our purposes. For their purposes, I would think it would make sense to take the course first. But, but there is no sequential you know, requirement. No. You can take the exam. You can take the course word. You can take it simultaneously. Right, because they're not yeah. going to be an associate. Right. Right. Mike? Hi, Mike Griffin from camp. I, this is a very small comment. Page six, you, I noticed it under um, the description of 12 hours of coursework in California law and ethics. The final sentence in red says, differences in legal and ethical standards in different types of work settings. There's something about that wording that it sounds like different legal standards in different settings. Maybe it would be better stated as the application of legal and ethical standards in different work settings. Right? This, just a small comment. Thanks. Thank you. Like that change? Yeah, say it again because I, I didn't you quite said application. The application of legal and ethical standards in different types of work settings. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's change that on all three. <laughs> okay. Um, so just strike that different type of work settings? Just or? application of. Application. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, then my next question is on page eight. Uh, where am I? Okay, this is experience gained outside. So this is the section that is where they're not licensed. Hours, yeah. Yeah. I was I'm looking at um, D A um, on the clinical exam. Yeah, in regulation set forth as accepted by the board. Yeah, so I just, oh, I think I just wanted to confirm. I'm trying to understand why I wrote this note. <laughs> um, this is a problem with reading it too far in advance. Um, so if they took the NCE, which is not our clinical exam, we're accepting it even if they're not two years. If that is the exam that allows them to practice at the highest independent level. Then we are. Okay. I just wanted to confirm. I don't know. I mean, that's a, a, a point for discussion. So under the current proposal, the NCE would be acceptable for somebody that's coming in, not under this section, but coming in as a, somebody licensed more than two years. In this case, if somebody is less than two years, we haven't accepted that exam. So it would have to be the exam we accept for our in-state people. Okay. So if, <clears throat> if they took uh, the NCE, because in our, in LPCC, 
world, it's the NCE or NCMHCE. Mm -hmm. So if they took the NCE, now they're going to have to take another exam, even though they're licensed in that state. Or they can wait, but. Or they can wait a year. <laughs> well, in some of those states that have been using the NCE, they're allowing the, if um, they want to work and build TRICARE, they have to take the, clini the, the, clinical. the clinical exam. And so that's. So few people are doing yes, it. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. All right. Just confirming that. And then on page, let me make sure. I already noted that. Oh, on um, page 9, um, toward the top of the page, D, um, I, 1, I guess. Um, so this may be irrelevant now because we had, will be doing this next year, but coursework taken to meet any deficiencies that last sentence shall be equivalent of three semester units or four quarter and one half quarter units of study. So we, were ta we had voted to Fine. change that to um, one quarter, in st I mean uh, four instead of four and a half. Yes. So does that just get changed after you just make it, a note in it now? If that, that bill gets signed, then when we then this draft of legislation will automatically will update it to include whatever current law is at the time. Okay, and that would be the same on page ten, number two a in, instead of fifteen semester units or twenty two and a half quarter right. units. So you'll make a note to change mm, that actually, if that well, passes. We're not. No, that one's not. That's not changing. That's not changing. No. Okay. Um, yeah, wherever it's four and a quarter, if the bill gets signed, um, the entire law gets updated. Okay. So that when we submit our changes, it'll be on current law. So it won't say four and a quarter, it'll automatically say four. Okay. Let's see. All right. And then just confirming on the bottom of page 10. So if they're licensed, they just do the six hours of the recovery orientation work. But if they're, sorry, if they're licensed two years or more, uh, six hours. But if they're licensed less than two years, they need to do the full 45. So really the only, uh, I don't know what else to call it, uh, advantage, if somebody's been licensed less than two years, the only advantage that they would have that they don't have to make up at this point would be the practicum piece. But everything else would have to be as if they weren't licensed. Right. So, well, I mean, maybe that's, if, if you're uncomfortable with that, that could be discussed. I mean, is the... Anytime you have the time cut off, it's going to create that issue where you're going to have some people right on the edge. The only other option that I can think of is be you just say if you're licensed in another state for any amount of time. And if you want to say that, oh, well, just the fact that you have that licensed, you know, shows a certain level of proficiency, then you could move forward that way. But otherwise, anytime we have the, any kind of licensed X number of years cut off, we're going to have those people on the edge. Yeah, yeah. And I think we need two years because they need to be practicing independently to give themselves a chance to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you get a supervisor, hopefully the supervisor's making sure you don't do that. So, okay. All right. Just wanting to confirm that. I mean, so, right now, at least for social work, it's four where you start to get to some advantages. So, we've, we're bringing it down a little bit. The, the issue still exists. All right, so is there anything else on the LPCC one that we need to discuss that other people? I just have a very, very minor um, question. So page eight, so it's C, um, it's the fifth line. In talking about you know, the, the, uh, the amount of the, the, uh, the time, the applicant held an active license, a good standing um, in, the other, in another state or country. And so, you know, is it like the practice for us that, you know, we, when we do out of state, that we will start also accepting the out of, uh, the out of country, um, counting our experience and, and. No, the way that it's written right now is that the people that are coming in under the new streamlined system, it's only another state or jurisdiction of the United States. So if somebody was from another country, um, they would need to qualify under this second option, which is more stringent. Just 
clarification because it's yeah. there. Yeah, it doesn't say that in the in the one for people licensed to. Well, it's for people licensed two or more years. It's for another state or jurisdiction of the U.S. Everybody else. That's why it says another country in this one. Everybody else um, licensed less than two years or another country falls into the other one. You know, that's exa uh, that explained to me, you know, why there is like the different languages. Because one you said another jurisdiction, the other state, it's another totals. state or country. And it's got to be yeah. another jurisdiction because there are jurisdictions of the United States that are not states. Right. Yes, yeah. true. Yeah. Very true. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for what, yeah, that clarification helps. Anything else under the LPCC item two? We're ready then to move on to the MFTs. Oh, do we do we make motions in here? <laughs> you can make a motion to recommend the language as edited. Okay. Suggest a change just and, and recommend it to the full board. Okay. So or I will. if you, yeah, if you want to do that, or if you want to wait and see if the other two professions kind of align, and then we can go back. Can we can go back and take motions on the agenda topics? Or do they need to do it now? Do we need yeah. to do one at a time, or can we do, do one all at three time. at once? Here's what I'm thinking. We either um, love it all today and bless it um, or not, but we're not going to know if we're going to love it all until we talk about the other two. So it might cause us to go back and change something in one. Can we? Okay. So no motion just yet. We can just keep talking. Okay. Change the motion. What's your pleasure? We just do one motion as if it's one agenda item to make okay. it make all the changes we discussed. Yeah. yeah. Across. Okay. It. Cool beans. Question: GV airs with Calpic. Um, on a little different here, but uh, on. Uh, Can you speak up a little bit? Sure. Sorry. Thank you. I mumble at times. My no, <clears throat> anyway, like I'm told by my family. <laughs> uh, on uh, four nine 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 point six two B one D. Two. What page are you on? I'm on page nine, if I'm not okay. mistaken. Two? Yes. Okay. It deals with differences in legal and ethical standards. There is a question. What is the difference between legal and ethical? Oh, so legal stand, okay, ethical, each uh, profession has a set of ethical standards. And sometimes the ethical standards are different than the law. So for example, for LPCCs, the ACA Code of Ethics says that um, one should not engage in a sexual relationship with a former client until five years past termination, whereas the law in California says two years. So there's a lot of differences between the law and, not a lot, there are some differences between the law and the ethical codes. And there are things that the ethical codes go into great, far more detail than what's written in statutes and regulations. Um, <clears throat> however, I think I have read that the law says, or maybe statutes or regulations, I don't know where, that that for LPCC, for example, they're following the ACA Code of Ethics, so in some ways that is the law, but then the ethics and law contradict in a few areas. So that's that's the difference. So ethics, then, violation of the Code of Ethics, then can become a violation of law. It yes. could, right. but sometimes could. you have to violate one to violate the other. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think yeah. And I think in that section we're going to change um, application the of. application of the legal and ethical yeah. standards okay. instead of differences in. It, yeah. Right. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Good. I think thank another you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think another example of that and let me know if I'm wrong, Kim, is that sometimes our our legal unprofessional conduct codes will just say general unprofessional conduct and we'll kind of look to the ethical code and get, have a subject matter expert weigh in on what the standards of practice is. So it kind of ties in that way. So kind of probably explaining to them how that works and how it can lead to a law. An ethical violation could lead to a law, um, unprofessional conduct violation in law. However, like there, one of the difficulties, for example, is all ethical codes say do what's in the best interest of your client. But if I'm taking the law and ethics exam and maybe I have a suspect, I, I suspect child abuse, what might be in the best interest of the client is to not report, but you're going to report anyway because it's the law. 
Because of the legal requirement. Because it's illegal. Right, that's right. Because sometimes we have to do what's legal when it doesn't, when the per perception of the therapist or many therapists may disagree that right. that's the right thing to do in the highest interest of the client. So, yeah, it's, exactly. it's complicated. So I tell my students, take the most conservative route. Um, it, only when ethics is more conservative than the law, otherwise follow the law. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. All right, shall we move on to LMFT now? Can we just talk about what's different? Um, so the LMFT language is shown in attachment B, it was um, drafted using the same criteria as LPCCs. Um, a couple of different things um, that, to bring up here. Um, the, in, in LMFT law, I added um, a nice feature of LPCC law has definitions of accredited and approved. And rather than writing that 500 times over and over again when we're talking about it, uh, I just added a definition of accredited and approved um, into the LMFT general definition section. Um, one caveat that um, the um, in 4980.36 and 37 were where MFT law currently talks about accredited and approved, it brings in um, as being acceptable a co-amped school, um, a co-amped accredited school. Um, and so I've brought that into the definition. It wasn't, co-amped wasn't currently mentioned in the out-of-state um, accredited or approved language, but we're bringing that into a general definition. It's questionable whether um, co-amped, um, is, requires a general, um, we accept it now, but it's questionable whether it's always in every case a USDE approved, but the board has in the past decided to accept co-amped. So I just went ahead and added that, that word and co-amped in there. So I wanna get some clarity on this. There are in the MFT world some programs that are co-amped accredited, but the university is not an accredited institution. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we think. So in LPCC, there are KCREP accredited programs, and maybe they're not part of an accredited institution. So should they not have the same language? I'm kind of curious because, the, you know, the, there's only nine co empty schools in California right now. I think Alliance is a big proponent of it. And part... Um, not WASC accredited? No, but I, my, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that they are probably accredited by the United States Department of Education because you cannot offer any kind of loans unless you have that designation or you're an accredited like WASC. Mm -hmm. And you move east, the um, regional accrediting acronym changes. Sure. But then there's USD you know, the United States Department of Ed. And we looked at this a while ago. I, like, the one school that comes to mind is the School of Theology up in Seattle. They're accredited by um, a body out of the US, Department of Education. And, and so they're, they're federally, basically federally accredited, but they're not accredited by WASC. Mm. But they have um, a program that's de designed to meet all of our requirements to be an MFT in California. So with the Department of Education accreditation and designation, they can offer um, federal loans for, for school. So I'm th I don't think we're gonna run into entities so much where you just single institution that's only accredited, the program is only accredited. Right, I wouldn't think a, but K an accrediting body right. would give accreditation to a school right. that's not on Right. I could run it out of my house if that was the case, right? <laughs> um, so, um, and the k Krebs standards, that, you know, that's kind of an interesting thought. I mean, if you're going to make it for co -amphity, I would want to do it for k Krebs as well. Right. It's already for co -amphity. It's already in there. And so it, it, while it looks like they're all USDE accredited, it did kind of leave the, there was some question left of whether it had to be 100% of the time. And so since we're basically moving the definition from one spot to the other, it doesn't hurt to put co empty in there because it's already in 4980.36 or 37. Um, we put KCREP here, then we have to put it in. We might have to put it the other it, place. Maybe it's something we can do down the road. I mean, I, 
my guess is it, it may not be relevant, but I, we're always looking to be consistent among the professions, and I know for social work, that's definitely, it's about the program more mm -hmm. than it is about the institution. So if we're gonna look at that, if that wave changes for the other two professions. Yeah, I don't see where we mention KCREP. We don't mention it in the definition. Don't mention KCREP in anywhere. anywhere. Okay, then you would know. Yeah. So if we're gonna add it, that. Um, On the August board meeting to discuss. Yeah, I think maybe we just take a look at that in general because there's a lot of the KCARP standards that are great. Um, follow them here, but if we were to move to say something like, you know, our KCARP program, it could make LPCC application a little more streamlined. Oh, yeah. Because now you're looking at an integrated type program, whether, you know, it's, your, it's going to be a. Yeah, it does. It, I I want to say it's going to be a superior program that because <laughs> I, that's not accurate though because no there can be programs who are not accredited that are superior, right. but there are no accredited programs that are inferior. Right. So you know, in in terms of streamline, as you, since we're looking at portability and streamlining, if you make it more, I don't know, give more weight to accredited programs. Um, first of all, they're they're going to meet the requirements unless they're just super old degrees because mm -hmm. uh, I know for LPCC we set it up for that. Mm -hmm. um, so the standards will likely be higher than what we require. Yeah, I think um, maybe as a, a separate agenda item, just mm -hmm. as a whole, totally focusing on, you know, maybe this is the lead in to sort of the, a, an additional cleanup of the LPCC law. So maybe we take that as a separate, okay. Yeah, not to prevent people who aren't accredited. I want to make mm -hmm. that really clear to anybody who's listening, but I just think that if they had a KCREP accredited program, then you don't have to scrutinize the courses in the same way you do now, which right. would save time, Right. which is true also for CoAMPT. Right. And for MFT applications now. Yeah. Don't look a lot of that. So, yeah, I think... So that's for later discussion that maybe, okay. I'll put that down on future agenda items. So I've stopped you on that bullet point, <laughs> Roseanne, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I think pretty much everything is, would be the same in the same discussion. Um, let's see. We've got the, um, got the the 3000 hours and we talked about the practicum issue already um we talked about the qualifying clinical exam score if they've already got it in another state we have that language in there we don't currently accept the national exam um for mft applicants but it's built in anyways in case we ever do um so we would want to leave that built in there um just in case um and Let's see the same deletion for the the uh, um, on page 22. It's similar, but it's a little different for LMFT. Um, the law and ethics. Um, LMFTs can actually take law and ethics coursework from a continuing education provider, unlike LPCCs, because LPCCs have it as a core content area. So adding a continuing education provider as an acceptable source isn't hurting anything there, but it's just repetitive because it's already discussed in 4980.81. So I would propose to delete that um, on subsection big B, the um, blue, um, where it says the coursework may, from, can be from an accredited or approved institution, et cetera. We would delete that, like we discussed before. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Anybody have any objections to that? So we'll make all the same changes that we did that are relevant here. Okay, is there anything else, um, questions about the MFT recommendation language, recommended language? Okay, let's move on to social work. All right, so social work, 
was the language looks a little bit different for social work just because MFT and LPCC are modeled after each other. So we had to, I had to treat social work a little bit differently. They have basically one giant section and it's 4996.17 that covers three different scenarios. It covers, there's the first part of it covers everyone and then it covers um, people licensed less than four years and licensed more than four years. So I had, I split um, 4996.17 into two sections. Um, one for licensed more than two years and then one for everybody else. So same concept, um, a slightly different, different look at the end. Um, but basically um, the issues specific to, let's see if there's anything specific to social work. Um, it's the same thing about the, the one hour of the 100 hours per month if they're, t if they're licensed for a license less than two years. Um, same thing about the clinic, accepting the clinical exam score for them. Um, oh, one interesting thing about the social work. So if you look at what I've drafted in 4996.17.1, um, we're, you know, part of the, part of the getting a license, if you're licensed more than two years out of state was you have to take, um, coursework in California cultures and California law and ethics. That's an LMFT, that's been up until now an LMFT and an LPCC thing, not an LCSW thing. So if they're coming in under the same deal here, um, and also MFTs and in-state MFTs and LPCCs have to take, and it's, it's more integrated, <coughs> we don't specify an hour requirement for in-state but we um, do state that it has to be there. LCSWs don't have that requirement at all. So um, if we're going to require it for the people that are basically coming in under this new system, the question becomes, um, do you want to discuss if, if California cultures and mental health recovery oriented care should apply to all LCSW out of state applicants? Should it apply to in-state applicants? We don't specify a lot of coursework for LCSWs. We let the, um, the accrediting the accreditation um, specify the coursework a lot more. Um, we do specify some, but uh, that's kind of the big question for L LCSWs. So my first thought is it's kind of like I get the logic that you're following what the the board or the accrediting body does. That makes total sense. And culture should is obviously part of the profession as is the re recovery oriented care like that all of that was recovery oriented care was born in social work um, out of the three professions um, so I'm gonna let the social workers make an opinion of that but my my thought is like well it should be there the California cultures I think is relevant because the people who are doing their hours here in California are getting California cultures but people who got their hours elsewhere are not getting California cultures so I'll definitely put that in. I think for the culture part, you know, we, when we're talking about the whole idea is for the out-of-state people, you know, to, ha to take some um, continuing education classes to get familiarized with um, the California culture. So because, you know, they don't live here. So I think, you know, the culture part, it, it's definitely, you know, it will make sense, you know, in order to, you know, have them take the class and then be familiarized with the population. Now, the, um, um, the mental health recovery um, oriented care. Also, it's born in California, and I'm not, you know, I, I know it's definitely more social work oriented, but at the same time, you know, now in, in the sense that if it's really California and social work, and I think the other social worker, you know, may need to also, you know, take a, take a look at that because it is a very different approach, you know, with all these, um, you know, the, the more the, the client oriented, you know, the, the empowerment and all those things. So um, I, I would say yes, and it's only a one time class. So yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think all three. Only one time, yeah. I agree. Three, yeah. Yeah, because the laws are so different from state to state and you can, it's to prevent them from getting in trouble because there are just some things that they would be doing it with good intention that's correct in their original state that would not be okay in this state. So um, for their own protection to follow the law, I think it's important that. Yeah, I think it's part of their acculturation to California, all three of those areas, really. It's not gonna kill them. We're not talking about years and years, you know. 
So there's no, is there a jurisprudence exam, a law and ethics exam for social workers also, yes. right? Yeah, yes. okay. So you're saying you want you want the courses for all for out all out of state and all in state. All, all out of state. So here's here's the thing with in so all out of state. I think we can put a period on that. So let's have a conversation about the in state. So the difference with the California cultures is that they're going to be doing their work in California, and culture is well integrated into social work practice and into their in their um, accrediting body. So to me, that would just be redundant and work that you guys don't need to do, it's there. Um, in terms of law and ethics, isn't that part, do, don't you have a law and ethics course? Is, I mean, yes. that and is part of. It's integrated throughout the program. Yeah, so and that would be the, redundant. So the right, question correct. is um, the recovery oriented care, then what, how's, well, recovery-oriented care ought to be, certainly ought to be in the programs, I would think. Are, are those Becca, what do you think? Yeah. Now, oh, yeah. Be, because what happens when you get a social work application from an in-state applicant, it's, as long as it's from an accredited school of social work, go forth to do good. We approve it. We don't look at the, the specific courses, okay. period. So because um, it's the Council of Social Work Education that specifies what that program needs to have. Okay, so all programs are going to have law and ethics and culture, right. but not all programs are going to have recovery-oriented care. So is it possible or social workers who are not getting this? I don't think so, because that's part of what gets tested. So they're having to pass the test. So I think, it, I think it's there. Okay. And, you know, in a lot of the practicum setting, you know, they're already in the mental health recovery-oriented um, you know, using that modality. So I, if you're asking in-state, I say no for the mental health oriented care and no to California culture. And, and well, unless, you know, because the it's law We've confirmed no that law the law and ethics. ethics is in the course. Yeah, like, we've already so. done the law. Yeah. Yeah. If they've already done it. Two, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so then the question becomes how much? So for California cultures, we have it written in as Thing um, okay, for same. all three professions. Just make it easy on yourselves. But what about um, the the less than two years? We want to build in the full amount, which for for MFTs, it's for out of state people less than two years. It would be. Let me find it really quick. Um, I think it's yeah, fifteen and forty five. That sounds right. I think it was yeah, forty five. Yeah, it's forty five. Yeah. I would say yes. Yeah. Okay, so the same as because as we have to assume that they aren't getting it in the other states, and so if if the other two professions need to do it, so so does this one. So yeah, I think you're right. It's it's if you're licensed, it was six hours, was yeah. it? And then six if hours. you're licensed two years, and if you're licensed less than two years, it's forty a full forty five hour course. And then, um, yeah, the same with law and ethics, the 12 hours we changed it to. And then for culture, it was six hours, was it? Yeah. yeah. Fine. Makes it easier for you guys to review. And Well, yeah, and then it, it makes it consistent, and, and Rebecca, I'm sure, is going to chime in. <laughs> to me, the, the logic is why would one profession be any different on those? You can't really justify, yeah. Yeah. Rebecca. Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter. To go back to the first conversation, I do agree with what you seem to decide on, which is that we need those, um, the um, law and ethics, the mental health recovery, California cultures for out of state, but not for in state, which is well within the social work education. Um, and I must apologize because I had to go back to the office and write lots of letters because all the bills got set for hearing today. So could you um, clarify the 45 hours, what, what, what you're talking about right now? Right now, um, when you come in as an LPCC or an L, um, it, you have to complete, a, and you're not licensed, you have to complete a 45 hour course in um, California cultures. And for LMFT, oh, it's, um, so right now, I'm you're missing it. 45. It's 45 for the mental health recovery oriented Never care, mind. 15 hours for the California cultures. Okay. So it's, it's a basically a three unit class. 
oh, okay. on what happens out here in California for practice, because it's based on that. Uh, uh, t oh gosh, what was it? It was passed in 2009, the MHSA Act. Well, oh, oh, four, I think. four, yeah, which doesn't necessarily occur across the country. So that was just right. to orient it, someone from out of state into how it, how California works. Right. And so the 45 hours has been the current requirement or what we're changing it to? Well, right now they're not having to do any of it. Okay. But it would become a requirement. For out of state people. For out of state applicant only. And so that's like a one, three hour, a three unit course, is that mm -hmm. what you were saying? Three semesters of the mental health recovery oriented care. Um, and then I think the 15 hours is like one semester unit for California cultures. And just how did we how did we come upon that? I'm just curious uh, that it would be 45 hours. That Sounds was like a lot, but I don't really was, you know no <laughs> particularly. Oh, Wasn't right. that for the when we had the out of state committee? Yeah. Okay. It, it was the out of state. They they made that determination, uh -huh. and it was applicable to LMFTs and LPCCs. I right. don't recall why we didn't include. LCSWs at the time, but they're not. I mean, because it started when we, when we put it in. I think it was through in 2009. We built that into the integrated degree program. So MFTs and um, LPCCs for their in-state law. It just says that you have to have the coursework. It doesn't specify how much. So when we did the out-of-state committee, um, we had to with a lot of coursework that's integrated. We have to we had to determine amounts, and that was the amount that the that the committee decided on for that for those two courses. Um, and so, and it was based on semester, you know, how many hours and, and they kind of weighed how, how much material there was, I think, and what's a reasonable amount of time to spend. I think that was also, you know, in address to, you know, the consistency with the uh, coursework. Mm -hmm. So that's why it comes up as a three semesters unit equals to 45 um, hours. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's really based on that uh, you know that uh, curriculum okay. requirement, the, the hours of, yeah. Okay. So I don't think I feel prepared to you know really give a definite answer right now, but this will still go you know once it leaves this committee it goes to P and A right, and then I can have time to talk to other yeah. people in our organization. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the 45 hours is a lot. I was really surprised when you guys came up with that. <laughs> Um, it is integrated throughout the programs because you have to have people coming in and talking, uh, consumers come in and talk, so that's a lot of it can get met with that. Um, yeah, and it should be integrated in most courses, but that's a lot. I think it was. It was six hours before? As a no, CD. I'm kidding. I mean, we had an entire oh, day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we went I think to, we've had 45 hours actually sitting on the board. But we went, we, yeah, we went to a clinic that was mm. Prop 63 funded. Yeah. And I I, in LA, if I recall correctly. I thought it was Fresno. There's one there too. Yeah. Spent the entire, the entire day. Watching that yeah. wrap around and all of that. Yeah. Very good. So just to summarize, so, um, the way that we would write it going forward, if you're um, you fall in the out of state for more uh, licensed for more than two years category, it would be 15 hours of California cultures and then the six hours of the mental health recovery oriented. If you're coming in less than two years, it would be same 15 hours for California cultures and then the 45 for the mental health recovery oriented, just like the other two. Other discussion, comments, questions, concerns. So how do you feel about this? I'm feeling good. <laughs> um, I think we're ready to make a motion. So what would the motion be? <laughs> Sabina, I'm looking at you. <laughs> so you're wanting, you're, you're wanting to integrate all the edits that been, have been suggested or accepted by you or um, put forth and all three, uh, I guess, agenda items addressing this out of state portability portability there you go but so you want to take them all so so you're going to move to accept proposed edits and then where is this going to pna next then it would go to pna okay i'll make that motion that sabina just said <laughs> I'll 
Moving to accept proposed edits and forward to PNA for approval. Is that correct? Recommendation. Approval. Dr. Leah Brew? Yes. Anna Wong? Yes. Renee Lawner? Yes. Motion carries. All awesome. right. We're getting closer. Yay. All right. So any suggestions for future agenda items? I think we made one looking at the cake rep piece. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Seeing none, public comment for items not on the agenda. All right, hearing none, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. It is two, I can't see, 28. <laughs> well done. Thank, Thank you. you. And we don't need. So this